Hi everybody, my name is Michael and we are here to present you NetCap, the first network-based cache attack on the last level cache of a remote machine. Imagine we have the following set. A client that does an SSH session to a server and another machine that is controlled by the attack. Our attack can break the confidentiality of that SSH session from the third machine without any malicious software running either on the client or the remote server. It does this by just sending network packets to the server. Let's look at it a bit more closely. So when the user types, one packet per keystroke uh, is sent to the server. Now, each of these packets will end up in the last level cache of the server. And we will see later on why this is. At the same time, an attacker launches a remote cache attack and reads out the cache activity from the last level cache. More precisely, our attack can leak arrival times of the individual network packets from the SSH session, which you can see here in orange. In the mess case, these are actually matching exactly the info typing information from the user. Together with some statistical analysis, we can then reconstruct words as humans have very distinctive typing patterns and therefore we can leak what you type in in your private SSH session. So previous cache attacks that we know needed somehow of a local code execution. So for example in a cloud settings an attacker controls a VM and then can spy on VM1 via the shared hardware. Uh, similar to that, in JavaScript, um, a malicious JavaScript that is served to the browser is then executed locally to spy on other processes or even like other tabs and so on. But still, the code has to be executed locally. Cache attacks in principle mean that we can observe if data is already in the cache. Um, here the caches are shown in the blue. Um, or if the data has to be fetched from main memory, also referred to as a cache miss, here shown in the gray box. One of the techniques to leak information from cache hits and misses is Prime and Probe. Let's look at this a bit more closely, as we also use Prime and Probe in our research, but of course over the network. So the first step is to prime the cache, which essentially means bringing the cache to a known state. Then the victim executes the program which potentially accesses a memory location that maps to a target cache set. Then in probe, we repeat our priming step, but this time we record the timing information from our accesses. High latency tells us whether a cache line in the target cache set was touched by the victim or not. After recording these cache hits and misses, we of course then can analyze them. And these timing information tell us a lot about of the behavior of programs and even users. So, for example, by just looking at cache hits and misses, researchers were able to leak crypto keys, um, guess visited websites via JavaScript, and spying on other tabs opened in the browser, or via Spectrum Meltdown even leak memory content. Let's look at the key technology that made it possible to launch a network cache attack. DDIO stands for Data Direct I.O. Technology, and it's enabled by default on all Intel server-grade processors since 2012. It's transparent to drivers and OS, so most people probably didn't even notice that something changed under the hood. Before DDIO, we had DMA, where a PCI device could store, uh, for example, a packet directly into main memory, where then the CPU would fetch it uh, when it had to work on it. Now, with DDIO, a PCI device is able to store, let's say, a packet directly into the last level cache, which is way faster, of course, for the CPU to fetch. So now we want to know what impact does DDIO have. We have here an Intel study that shows um, transactions per second uh, on different uh, scenarios. So we have um, a setting with 2, 4, 6, and 8 uh, NICs. And uh, in the dark blue, you have a setting without DDIO, and in light blue, you have a setting with DDIO. And what you can essentially see is that without DDIO, uh, the throughput 
basically stop scaling after having four or more NICs. There are three main challenges that we needed to overcome for implementing our network cache attack. Our attack requires a precise knowledge of the effects of DDIO and its inner workings. Then we had to build a remote version of Prime and Probe, which can continuously monitor cache activity over the network. Lastly, we needed to understand what sensitive data may reside in the DDIO reachable part of the last double cache. For the first two challenges, we needed something that allows us to granularly control what memory location that we would access on the remote machine. This is where RDMA comes in handy. In a traditional TCP IP stack, a TCP packet that is received by the NIC is then put into the various buffers which are handled by the operating system kernel and then the application can access the contents of the packet. Now with RDMA, which stands for Remote Direct Memory Access, we can bypass the kernel, thus allowing the NIC to read and write data to arbitrary offsets within the allocated space, which gives us the granular remote access we need to overcome our challenges. RDMA is extensively used in the backend of big data centers and cloud infrastructures. Also file protocol as SMB and MFS allow uh, RDMA support. Other applications, of course, are high performance computing, uh, as mentioned, data centers and cloud, and uh, also storage. As we know, DDIO is enabled by default. Therefore, when we use RDMA on a newer Intel CPU, we do not only have arbitrary access to a pin memory region, but also to parts of the last level cache. As you can control the offsets of the accesses, we can also indirectly control what we are doing in the last level cache. This is the foundation of our attack. Let's look a bit more in detail about how we reverse engineered DDIO. There are essentially two questions we needed to answer in order to launch a successful attack. The first one is how and when is data loaded into the last level cache over DDIO? And if we could actually distinguish cache hits and misses from the NIC over the network. The second question is if we could access the full last level cache or just portions of it, because this matters a lot in terms of attack surface. To answer how DDIO interacts with the last level cache, we did many different experiments. Here I present you the key outcomes of our reverse engineering. Let's start with the simple code snippet on the left. Here we do a timed RDMA read operation on offset X. We expect that this will cause a cache miss, so the read operation will be served from the memory of the remote machine. On the right, you can see the corresponding distribution of access times for different offsets. Now, we're writing data to offset X via RDMA. This write operation will overwrite another entry in the cache on the remote machine. Then, we do another timed RDMA read, again on offset X. This will result in a cache hit unless it has been overwritten by another entry in the meantime. Now we can overlay the two distribution of access times from the two read operations. As you can see, we can clearly distinguish cache hits in orange and misses in blue over the network. We can also see artifacts of the network, like long tails and overlapping. Our reverse engineering further showed that we need this write operation in the middle as read requests are not allocating in the last level cache with DDIO. Now to the second question. Unfortunately, our reverse engineering showed that DDIO does not give us access to the whole last level cache. It has an allocation limitation of two cache rays, potentially to protect the last level cache from trashing. However, our work showed the cache rays are not dedicated meaning that both the CPU and PCI devices can utilize these two cache ways. Also different PCI devices use the same two cache ways, which is great news as we still have a shared resource. So let's recap this attack surface. An attack from the network to the whole CPU is quite difficult as you can only have access to 10 to 18% of the last level cache. But other PCI devices use the same two cache ways so we have a full visibility of what other PCIe devices are doing in the cache. That's why we decided to do an attack that is quite novel. We profile another PCIe device over the network without any influence of the CPU. So now let's look at the end-to-end -end attack. 
as I explained in the beginning, we have a topology where a client connects to a server via SSH and server number two is actually controlled by an attack. And this attacker controlled uh, server does a remote cache attack to the server um, which the SSH connection goes to. So the SSH uh, session goes to a normal Ethernet NIC and the attacker launches its attack over an RDMA enabled NIC. So let's look a bit more closely what is actually happening in the last level cache. The IP stack uses a ring buffer to queue data asynchronously. So let's see what happens when a network packet arrives to the server. On the left, you have the ring buffer, and on the right-hand side, you have the cache activity as observed by the attack. Now we have a packet that was arrived, is put into the ring buffer, and we can also see that a certain cache um, line is activated. Now a second packet is, arrives, uh, again put into the ring buffer and what we can see is that now with a relative offset one to the previous cache line another cache activity is lighting up. Now the same happens for three for packet three and four and now we can see that in uh, the cache activity we have this relative path this staircase pattern um, that is emerging. Now we know now that this is the ring buffer uh, leaves a predictable pattern that we can exploit to get information when a packet was received. Let's look at that example. This is the cache activity when the server receives constant ping. You can directly see the staircase pattern and also you can observe when the ring buffer reuses location as it is a circular buffer. Unfortunately, when a user types over SSH, the pattern is not as nice as with constant pings. First of all, there is much more delay between packets, and secondly, we don't control when we actually have to measure. Therefore, we needed a bit more of a sophisticated pipeline. The first stage is the online tracker, which observes a window of cache lines where the ring buffer should be activated next. The tracker has to be fast in order to have a high sampling rate. Here on the left, you can see a visual output of what the online tracker produces over time. The offline extractor then is in charge of computing the likeliest occurrence of client SSH network packet. It, is, it uses information from the online tracking and the predictable pattern of the ring buffer to do so. The output is then the inter-packet arrival times of different words. The last step of our attack is then that we now have just inter-arrival times, but we actually want to have full words to do something meaningful, right? So in the best case, um, the information that we got now from the remote cache is exactly the same as the user was typing. Now, um, as we remember, uh, humans have distinct typing, uh, typing patterns. So we used some statistical learning to achieve the mapping to words again. So in our study, we used a data set that contains of 20 subjects typing free and transcribed text, uh, which uh, in total were over 4,500 unique words which is on average a bit more than 20, uh, 228 unique words per subject. Each word was represented as a point in the multidimensional space and new points were categorized by Euclidean space to other words, uh, basically the QA nearest neighbor algorithm. Our main goal was to prove that our signal from the remote cache attack is strong enough to launch an attack. We did this in a conservative way. The K nearest neighbor algorithm, which we used, is a very basic machine learning classifier. We also used a dataset with multiple subjects and a relative large word corpus to show generality. First, we used our classifier on the raw keyboard data, so measured directly on the local keyboard, which gives us perfect and precise timing data. We have an accuracy there of 35% and a top 10 accuracy of 85%. In the top 10 metric, the classifier can guess 10 words instead of one. Then we use the same classifier on the remote signal, which is obviously less precise due to noise factors, and we could even miss or add additional predicted keystrokes. We have there an accuracy of 11% less and a top 10 accuracy of 58. All the cache timing data was recorded real time and each sample was only recorded once. So the same scenario as a real attacker would have. As we just used a very basic classifier, we, could all, we also believe that these results could be improved by a lot by using a more sophisticated keystroke classifier.
But now let's see the exploit fully working. On the left hand side, you see now the two attacker screens. And on the right hand side, you see now the victim that starts an SSH session. Now on the left hand side, the attacker starts to build up the attack, um, starting up the online um, tracking and also offline extractor. And now you can see on the right hand side, the victim is typing. And on the left hand side, you see the first prediction of Netcat, uh, which can predict the correct words just by sending network packs. Let's come to mitigation. In our view, the only mitigation at the moment is either to disable DDIO or do not use RDMA. Both comes with quite a performance impact. Intel in their publication on Disclosure Day sounded a bit different, but read it for yourself. Of course, there is another thing we want to discuss. The name of our paper. NETCAT stands for Network Cache Attack. It was a pun, however, as it is with humor, it can backfire. And in our case, it backfired massively, causing a small Twitter drama. Uh, somebody even sent us an alternative name together with the logo, which I quite like. Let's come to the conclusion. Increased peripheral performance has forced Intel to place the last level cache on the fast IO path in its processors. With Netcat, we could prove once more that exposing more shared microarchitectural components has a direct security. Intel acknowledged our findings, public disclosure was back last autumn, and we also received a bug bounty payment. We believe that we have merely scratched the surface of the possibilities for network-based cache attacks. We expect similar attacks based on Netcat in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.